Um, thanks very much, um, everybody, for um, being here and spending some time on uh, Tuesday evening to um, uh, be part of this conversation. I, I look forward to um, our dialogue afterwards. Um, so my name is Joshua Tan. Uh, a PhD candidate in history at uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm currently zooming in from Singapore. And uh, my paper today is titled Nanyang University in the Trans-Pacific Cold War. So it draws on some of my dissertation research that looks more broadly at the kind of politics of Chinese higher education in the Cold War. Uh, let me just share my screen. So um, give me one second. Uh, okay. So, um, so let's begin. Um, so I'll set the stage first, just with introducing these two yes, images um, of two groundbreaking ceremonies months apart in 1953. On the right-hand side, of course, a, a picture which is quite familiar in histories of, of kind of uh, post-war Malaya and Singapore, right? Tan Lak Sai breaking ground in Jurong, where he announced the founding of the South Seas at the Nanyang University as a new chapter for the Chinese culture taking root and thriving in Malaya. Months later, Vice President Richard Nixon broke ground at the East China Sea of Donghai, Daxue, Donghai University in Taiwan, affirming American commitments also to supporting higher education for the overseas Chinese. As in his words, it is vitally important that the overseas Chinese are directed in the right channels rather than the wrong channels right, towards China. Of course, Tan's anti-colonialism and Nixon's anti-communism came from very different places. But what united them was really the context of the Cold War and their shared interest in supporting education for the overseas Chinese. And in fact, it was not only Nixon and Tan, but in the aftermath of the 1949 Chinese Communist Revolution, multiple proposals for Chinese universities in the diaspora flourished. Right? They were drafted and debated by American officials, Chinese intellectuals in exile, missionaries, and indicated a broad interest to establish Chinese universities in places with strong ethnic Chinese presence including Hawaii, the Philippines, Thailand, and Malaya. At the same time, a number of post-secondary colleges were already founded in Hong Kong by Chinese refugee intellectuals funded by American missionaries and foundations, likewise to educate the Chinese youth among the refugee population. Thus, even though institutional histories of Nanyang University cite Nanda as an exception, right, the only Chinese medium university outside of China, it was not an anomaly in the early 50s, but rather one of the most prominent initiatives amidst a broader wave of institution building as higher education became a site of Cold War struggles in the region. And so today's paper draws on my ongoing dissertation research at UC Santa Cruz, looking broadly at how higher education in the Chinese diaspora was shaped by and shaping geopolitics in the early Cold War. Right? Um, in my talk today, I want to draw on an overlooked trope of US-based archive to highlight the understudied role of American interventions in Nanta. I hope to answer the following questions. How did American anti-communist agendas align with, encounter, collide with maybe anti uh, local anti-colonial struggles in Singapore, Malaya, and the early Cold War? What was the specific nature of American influence in Nanda? Of course, you know, often talked about, but rarely studied with empirical evidence. And finally, the more parochial, but I think quite interesting question, which is also quite revealing, which is how and why did so many Nanda graduates go to the US for graduate school? Right, so in this paper, I want to make three arguments. First, that American interest in free Chinese or free Asian higher education was core to its broader agendas of containing China in free Asia. And these policies relied on utilizing a large group of non or anti communist intellectuals in the diaspora on both sides of the Pacific. By American interest here, I refer to what uh, Axel Schaefer describes as a state private network in post war America, where the federal government sought to attain its policy objectives by funding and regulating activities through nonprofits rather than creating government agencies. Second, um, I argue that one of, uh, at Nanyang University, these anti communists interests converged and collided with diasporic Chinese and anti-colonial agendas. And I illustrate this through the Committee for Free Asia, the Asia Foundation's efforts to strengthen the Nanyang faculty by bringing in Chinese scholars from outside. And thirdly, I argue that one of the PAP's first agendas upon taking power in 1959 was to co-opt this existing American presence at Nanyang for its own interests, thus laying the groundwork for a much accelerated US-Singapore educational collaboration and partnership. So in making a case for situating Nanyang University in the Trans-Pacific Cold War, I draw on work in a Trans-Pacific studies, you know, which really came out of American studies, right, to foreground the uh, multiple impacts of American empire building on both sides of the Pacific, right, in the process connecting Cold War Asia and Asian America. Although 
Anthropologist Yonit Kwon has used the term Trans-Pacific Cold War chiefly to highlight the long-term legacies of trauma and violence based on US militarism um, in Cold War Asia. As a scholar of migration and diaspora, I draw on Cold War cultural studies to highlight how moments of rupture like the Cold War, like 1949, also saw recombination elsewhere, right? Where cutting off US educational ties in China in fact, stimulated very generative institution building elsewhere in places like Taiwan, and Singapore, and Hong Kong. So I'm going to proceed in three parts. First, I'll introduce American efforts to aid a select privileged group of refugee intellectuals in the aftermath of the 1949 Chinese Revolution as part of its developing strategy in Asia. Second, I trace how I look at how these policies shape Nanyang University through American efforts to shape or strengthen the faculty to counter the presence of unreliable merchants and left-wing activist students. Finally, I trace how the PAP government co-opted this American interest to strengthen Nanyang faculty for its own state building develop, um, agendas. And I'll conclude with a brief comparison with the parallel trajectory of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, while reflecting finally on the legacies and contemporary political stakes of this history. Okay, so uh, part one to think about um, refugee intellectuals in the Cold War. So among the nearly 3 million people who fled China's borders following the 1949 Chinese Communist Revolution, students and scholars stood out because of their st perceived strategic value to American interests in Asia. Right? These stranded scholars, refugee intellectuals, who were clustered in Hong Kong and the United States were not simply helpless refugees, right? victims of colonial racism, McCarthyism in the US, but also received unprecedented assistance from US government and private missionary sources, leading one historian, Peter Kwong, to describe the stranded scholars as the only Chinese who benefited from the Cold War. For instance, in a prominent ex-China missionary Republican congressman, Walter Judd played a major role in securing $10 million of State Department funding for the 5,000 stranded Chinese scholars in the US, while also publicizing the cause of what he described as the over 10,000 American educated Chinese stranded in Hong Kong, describing aid to refugee intellectuals not as humanitarianism but as national interest. He defended these policies to aid these American educated Chinese, as it is hardly short of criminal to spend years and years training these leaders, winning them to Western philosophy and then abandoning them altogether. In other words, quite early on these American efforts to contain Chinese communism, scholars and students outside of China were seen as indispensable to their strategic objectives. This American desire to create a free China by making use of these exiled intellectuals in the diaspora met a fertile ground in post-war Southeast Asia, where immigration restrictions has disrupted long-standing practice of Chinese students traveling to China for education. In fact, by the early 50s, a number of local-led Chinese educational institutions were well underway. For instance, in British Malaya and Singapore, wealthy local merchants who had made their fortunes during the wartime rubber boom now announced their intention to found new private schools and colleges for students unable or unwilling to go to communist China. Of course, Nanyang University was one of the prominent projects at this time, but you know it was not the only one. Right, One of the other very ambitious projects which preceded it by two years was Hanjiang High School in Penang. Right? Um, and of course, local histories enshrined the contributions of merchants like Tan Lap Sai, Lin Lian Teng, who founded Hanjiang High School. Um, and of course, the many other working class Chinese who contributed at personal, considerable personal expense. But the interesting thing, which is often overlooked in the institutional histories, is that these new found um, schools and colleges um, immediately looked to the United States for US-based or US-educated staff, a Chinese to staff the faculty. For instance, Hanjiang High School made a great deal of publicity over hiring six PhDs on its teaching staff, including the well-known Princeton-educated scholar Zhuang Zexuan as its founding principal. And likewise, Nanyang University also rose to international attention with the recruitment of Lin Yutang, an intellectual celebrity and probably the well best known Chinese intellectual in the West as its inaugural chancellor. Right, so Lin Yutang's arrival in Singapore rapidly entangled this local educational initiative with Cold War struggles in the region. Twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature, a renowned linguist and inventor, right, Lin was you know, very, very famous intellectual, and he departed in New York New York to Singapore in August of 1954 with the promise to recruit a first-class faculty from the Chinese refugee intellectuals in the US to staff this first-class Chinese university beyond China. Right, pointing to the underutilized intellectual talents in the diaspora on his side of the Pacific, Lin noted that there are lots of Chinese PhDs who haven't been able to get better jobs than running groceries on Broadway, 
working as waiters or raising poultry. They are going to become the teachers. Now, American operatives in Asia, like the State Department's Chinese Assistance Branch, USIS, the CIA French organization, the Committee for Free Asia, were initially unfamiliar with the local merchant sponsors of Nanyang, but saw the possibility of a new locally funded Chinese university led by Chinese Americans as a positive development, which directly aligned with their policies to mobilize the overseas Chinese in free Asia. While the British were skeptical of this unlikely alliance between liberal intellectuals, a group of uneducated but very wealthy capitalists and left-leaning students, the official position of the US consul in Singapore was much more positive. The Committee for Free Asia likewise promised to do all it can to rally American support from educational institutions to make Nanyang and particularly Lin Yutang's role a success. And I'll talk more about the Committee for Free Asia later on. And suffice to say that you know, it was one of the early you know, Singapore-based US agents which really identified the tension very early on in Nanyang's pronouncements between its claims as a kind of Malayan nationalist institution, right? Representing the ethnic Chinese localization in Malaya, as well as it's the tension with, you know, its regional commitments, right? Sometimes it spoke on behalf of the 10 million Chinese in Southeast Asia. And from the logics of American region-wide containment of communism, the Committee for Free Asia was not interested in a local university, right? But it aimed to give Nanyang greater regional emphasis if possible. Of course, Lin Yutang's fall from grace in Singapore is well known in the annals of Nanda history. So I'll just summarize very briefly here. Right? On arrival, Lin had heated arguments with Tan Lak Sai over enrollment, remuneration, building plans, you know, driving a wedge into an already fraught with partnership. His penchant for telling jokes in public, like likening students to teaching undergraduates to smoking ham, for instance, right? locking them in an air-conditioned library to let knowledge diffuse, was poorly received by local audiences, right? many of whom had donated at considerable expense and wanted a more serious approach. The local press, which you know, initially embraced his academic celebrity, quickly repudiated his fantasies of first-class university. And the university council's failure to approve his budget by 1955, February, ultimately sealed his fate. He resigned and left Singapore by April. Right, a mere six months after arriving and before a single student had enrolled. In Nanyang's official founding history of 1956, Lin was ridiculed as too used to eating the American ham. Right? He was not used to oriental rice. He attempted to create a world-class university but failed miserably. So Lin's departure with his first class faculty from the Ivy League, of course, marked a significant dent in this free Chinese university ideal. But it was not the end of American attempts to partner with diasporic Chinese in contests in what the State Department post-mortem describes as a social and intellectual climate which was unfavorable to intellectually oriented anti-communist activity. Rather, there was a continued interest in strengthening Nanda, particularly through the strategic cultivation of non- or anti-communist Chinese intellectuals who could be positioned on the teaching staff. In contrast to the trope of the privileged Western expatriates at the University of Malaya, but the refugee intellectuals in Nanyang were largely marginalized, precarious presence. While student memoirs, of course, reflect on the rhythms of campus life in Yunnan Gardens, punctuated by participation in political activism and protests. The experiences of time for these refugee professors were quite different. They were hired after the departure of Lin Yutang. They were all hired on one-year contracts and lived in constant fear of contract non-extension and deportation. Their voices are a curious absence you know, in an otherwise meticulous theme. Uh, well-documented institutional history. So for instance, we can consider the voice of somebody like uh, inaugural dean of arts, Zhang Tianzi, right, who was writing in the wake of the Chinese middle school protests of 1956, noting that he was completely unaware of anything, any sympathies with the university, with the Chinese middle schools, right? Everything was per normal, right? He claims ignorance. And this would be a persistent theme whenever teachers were questioned about student politics, even to the 60s, 10 years later, History professor Danny Kwok, right, in his uh, interview with the National Archives of Singapore, claims that he was a guest. He didn't ask questions. All the faculty were acting, right, acting dean of arts, acting uh, bursar, um, acting heads of department, so on and so forth, right. They were all very precarious and they did not want to wade into local politics. Of course, some recent Chinese language scholarship has noted the southward diffusion of the May 4th spirit by leading figures and intellectuals coming to Singapore because of Nanda, right? Like the author Lin Shu Hua, Se Xuanman, and even Han Su Yin. But this idea of a Nanyang Renaissance may also be overstated. It also overlooks internal tensions, for instance, right? Famous author Lin Shu Hua wrote quite a bit about the, the very pleasant Nanyang campus, right? In an interview with the British Special Branch, reflected sentiments of the newly arrived faculty. 
right? It's being quite unhappy, not being consulted on building construction, on planning the budget, subject to low salaries and beholden to the whims of Tan Lao Tsai. And so reading against the grain in some of the government documents, which have been well cited, we can also see defensive or, or where the professors show up, right? For example, like for instance, Lee Kuan Yew's famous speech where he likened Nanyang University to a university of Yenan, you know, because of left-wing students, right? Professors and lecturers on year-to-year -year contracts, renewable or will cannot have economic security, let alone academic freedom. Right? Of course, we don't have to accept Lee's uncharacteristic defense of academic freedom to discern the imbalance of power. The same thing with the Federation uh, government's report on communism in the Nanyang University. Right? So from the US archives, however, we can see an extensive interest in the role of the teachers in Nanyang, especially given state foundation commitments to supporting refugee Chinese intellectuals. Uh, the USIS branch in Singapore and Committee for Free Asia representative kept dossiers not of Nanyang students, but of faculty paying special attention to the American educated Chinese present there. Right? In particular, um, the role of the Committee for Free Asia was one of the was one I think very important and overlooked um, aspect in early Nanta history, right? Because it had made overseas Chinese higher education, particularly the sponsorship of refugee intellectuals in the diaspora, as one of its key priorities. Right, so to introduce briefly, right, the Committee for Free Asia, I mean, uh, later on in the mid '60s, exposed as a CIA covert front organization, had established Singapore branch office with a representative stationed in Singapore in 1952, alongside representatives across ten other Asian cities. Right, it was ostensibly a private foundation based in San Francisco and initially aimed at undermining Chinese communism through propaganda radio free Asia broadcasts. By 1955, it was reconstituted as an Asia foundation, right? Support aiming to provide seed funding to free Asian initiatives led by Asians, especially in the educational and cultural front. And one of its key policies regarding the Chinese outside of mainland China was strengthening free Chinese institutions capable of inculcating democratic principles to resist communism. And so multiple scholars have looked at the Asia Foundation archives to discern its work in a vast variety of fields like media, information, and film. But higher education was in fact very much core to the foundation's work. And they made supporting the refugee Chinese intellectuals and on the Nanyang faculty as a core goal, right? Between 1956 to 65, it was actively involved in helping Nanyang strengthen its teaching staff, right, including faculty recruitment, payments, and sponsorship of more than 10 members of the faculty. Here, what I want to highlight is not the fact that of, of any conspiracy of being funded by a kind of CIA front organization. I mean, nobody knew at the time. But instead, I want to highlight two things. Right? First, the precarity of the professors, which made them quite willing to receive US assistance. Second, um, and second, secondly, I mean, the fluid networks across what the Committee for Free Asia describes in one of its early policy papers as an invisible university connected by the web of funding and networks, especially across Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, right? Um, so between in the early stages of Nanda history with the first four, um, first four years between 1956 to 59, this assistance involves strategic sponsorship of you know, scholars, older scholars to Nanyang. And then later on, after 1959, it responded to recruitment requests from Nanda leadership to support Chinese scholars based in the US, right, mostly recruited to the College of Commerce. These individuals, of course, have been largely ignored in local histories because they were only in Singapore for very, very short periods, one or two years before leaving for Hong Kong, Taiwan, or the US. So I'm going to, because of time, I won't introduce too many individuals, but just to give a sampling, right? So you have, you know, some, 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 some key individuals, right, um, who were recruited in the early years came from the, the refugee colleges in Hong Kong, which were, of course, also founded with US assistance, like Ren Tai, right? Somebody like, uh, you know, Oberlin Harvard educated, you know, one time secretary of Chen Li Fu, the, the Kuomintang's Minister of Education, uh, Yu Xie Zhong, also uh, one of the early founding professors of New Asia College in Hong Kong, one of the refugee colleges, right? They were recruited, right, with the promise that Singapore is a rich colony with much better opportunities. And then, you know, also, we can see some of the logics in this document here, right? The Nanyang is, this is, uh, is you know, under pressure from left-wing sources, but the faculty, right, the professors, right, there are a number of strong anti-communists, right? So, um, so, so, so these were some of the individuals, uh, some younger individuals who were recruited from the United States straight to the College of Commerce, include somebody like Yang Chao Fan, right, Chaucer Yang, who actually became a private secretary to uh, Vice Chancellor Zhang Zhuling uh, between 1959 and 60, right? He stayed in Singapore also for a short period, but produced quite a bit of good intelligence about kind of intra-faculty disputes. Um, and there's a bunch of other people not 
and on the payroll of American foundations, but who wanted to go to the US and they found themselves in Nanyang, but they were not that happy in Singapore as well. Somebody like Zhou Peizhi, right? PG Chao, uh, who was also teaching in the Faculty of Arts from 1957 to 59, right? He had a, sustained a correspondence with Walter Judd, right? Over the 1950s, right? He wanted to go to the US. He didn't want to go to Singapore. Of course, he never made it then. He spent, you know, most of his career in Singapore and then going on to Taiwan, right? He characterized himself as a pro-American anti-communist, right? And uh, one of the most fascinating figures, I think, who's been very much understudied, Zhang Tianzi, the picture on the right, who was um, Dean of Arts from 56 to 59. He was trying to go to the US since 1950, right? He sustained a decades-long correspondence with his teacher at Harvard Yanjing Institute, a whole year, a William Hong. So he tries to go to the US in 1950. He ended up in Singapore, but then by 1959, you know, he's also booted out of Nanyang. He's also trying to go to the US. He finally makes it to Hawaii in 1960, but then dies soon after that in 1963. Right. So, you know, very interesting, important, but quite understudied figures in the early history of Nanyang University. Um, and so without any government support in the first decade, Nanyang University leadership was quite willing to receive this uh, support from the Asia Foundation, especially for faculty recruitment in the wake of a large-scale resignation following the 1959 University Review Commission, which recommended the non-recognition of degrees. From the Asia Foundation's perspective, though, Nanyang's over-reliance on American assistance for staffing was also concerning as it may have masked internal conflicts that were brewing. As one of its operatives, Yuan Lunren, uh, you know, evaluating repeated requests for staffing assistance, right? He analyzed, right? I believe that the trouble is not because of social conditions in Singapore, it's the millionaire's attitudes towards the employees, right? The professors, and of course, the kind of funny anecdote of a Tan Lak Sai saying to the professors, no wonder they'll never get rich. They complain about 18 hours of work a week, while I work 20 hours a day, right? Anyway, despite their reservations, the Asia Foundation still helped Nanyang with faculty recruitment right, from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the US. But their efforts in this first decade were stymied by the fact that many of the refugee intellectuals wanted to go to the US, not Singapore. Those who were taken up permanent residency in the United States under the Refugee Relief Act of 53 had to renew their green cards annually. And coupled with the uncertainty of the one-year contract, it was quite difficult to bring in people to Singapore on a permanent basis. Overall, in this first 10 years, the Asia Foundation expended 200,000 US dollars supporting their salaries, while concluding that although there were significant merits in bringing more Chinese-speaking Americans to Nanyang, these Chinese-American scholars overall had a negligible influence on shaping the student body. By the turn of the decade, however, the Asia Foundation's most consequential effort came in the form of an ambitious but largely known, unknown Singapore Nanyang Graduate Fellowship, which was aimed at supporting from among the first cohort of Nanyang graduates, a new generation of local US educated teaching faculty for Nanyang. In this program, the collaborations with the newly elected PAP government rather than Nanyang University proved to be more fruitful. So historians of Singapore-US relations have, of course, noted that in the immediate aftermath of the 1959 election, which brought the PAP to power, it saw significant tensions over perceived American subversion in the 1959 election, right? Payments to Minister Chu Sui Kee from a New York bank account. However, amidst this broader wave of anti-American, anti-colonial sentiments in the PAP, its leadership had actually also identified American interests in Nanyang as a possible opportunity to leverage. Interestingly, on the occasion of Lee Kuan Yew's first visit to Nanda, to Nanda in October 1959, he initiated conversations with the Asia Foundation's representative in Singapore whether, on whether they could provide 100 graduate scholarships in science to send Nanda graduates to the US for training. This would do a great deal to ally the American bitterness among the Chinese in Singapore, Lee noted. And he even claims that this program, right, in collaboration with the Singapore government, would have a much more immediate and greater benefit than anything else the foundation could undertake. So this unprecedented offer from a left-wing government to develop a close relationship with the Asia Foundation was greeted in its San Francisco office as a massive opportunity that even surpassed its local budget to the extent that it had to activate its reserve fund in San Francisco to support. And yet widespread criticism, uh, skepticism over the qualifications of the unrecognized Nanta degrees also raised fears that these graduates who could not complete their postgraduate degrees would damage the foundation's reputation. In the months leading up to Nanda commencement in April 1960, multiple back and forth negotiations between the Asia Foundation, the ETS, the Educational Testing Services, and the State Department's Institute of International Education 
finally ensured that Nantai graduates would be admitted to US graduate schools with no standardized tests, no applications, no English language tests, but only evaluation from a local selection committee. Ironically, just as US operatives were working hard to affirm the credibility of Nanta graduates to secure their admission to US universities, the Singapore government was also shifting subtly in its emphasis. By March of 1960, Asia Foundation's John Fleming wondered if they had been misled by the Singapore government, as now the basic objective of the project was to create a source of technical professional skills to assist the government of Singapore while strengthening the Nanyang faculty is a collateral objective. As agreements were being finalized, the MOE suddenly requested to expand the scholarship to Singapore University and Singapore Poly graduates, renaming it a Singapore Graduate Fellowship and placing it under the leadership of the PSC. In a classic case of what John Lewis Gaddis has described as tails wagging dogs, right, or local actors subverting superpower agendas for their own interests, Fleming concluded that the government's ultimate agenda may have been to redirect Asia Foundation funds away from Nanyang to Singapore University and Singapore Poly, while safeguarding foundation funds exclusively for Singaporean rather than Federation students. Lamenting these changes, Fleming concluded that the Singapore Graduate Scholarship Project has since its inception been associated with Nanta in our discussion with the MOE in our own thinking. Unfortunately, there's been less and less reference to Nanyang as a source of candidates. This scholarship program nevertheless still ran its course from 1961 to 64, educating over 60 graduates from Singapore at a significant expenditure of nearly half a million dollars, producing you know, US educated civil servants from post-independent Singapore. Of course, while this was no longer a Nanta project, Nanyang graduates were still very prominently represented. According to Nanyang alumni Wang Kang Ding's tabulations, and Wang himself was also an Asia Foundation grantee. The Asia Foundation was the largest sponsor of the first five cohorts of Nanta graduates studying abroad. You know, of 81 graduates who went to the US, 30 took up foundation scholarships, and their stellar performance in graduate schools, of course, opened up further pathways to subsequent cohorts. Upon return to Singapore, however, many of the grantees were disappointed with their job placements, as, of course, the government was no longer concerned with staffing Nanyang instead placing these US educated scholars in a range of jobs in the civil service. Of course, there were exceptions and one of the most prominent scholarship grantees from Singapore University was uh, a young uh, Tony Tan King M. Right? The only one sponsored to MIT, the only one permitted to extend his studies for a PhD degree because of his genius in experimental nuclear physics. But in a variation on the same theme of misaligned research agendas, when he returned to Singapore, he suddenly shifted his research trajectory from nuclear physics to traffic control operations. The Singapore government, nevertheless, was very satisfied with this project. And in 1967, as a culmination of a long conversation over the recognition of US degrees, specifically cited this Asia Foundation scholarship as a reason for Singapore government's decision to recognize American medical degrees and more broadly, US degrees as on par with Commonwealth University degrees for the civil service scholarships. So in conclusion, I suppose uh, these goals of cultivating loyal Singapore citizens, which is where I end off in the mid 60s, is admittedly a far stretch from the early Cold War US logic of supporting Chinese refugee intellectuals and free Chinese higher education in the wake of 1949. Nevertheless, these transformations across the 50s reveal shifts in how you know, the Chinese higher education in the Cold War was politicized, right? The story of Nanyang's localization under the PAP, of course, resulting in the merger into NUS in 1980 is a well-known story in the annals of Singapore history. But from the perspective of US agencies like the Asia Foundation, which did in fact affirm the necessity of supporting localization, Nanda's role as a regional hub was gradually diminishing in strategic significance. Instead, by the turn of the 60s, it was the Chinese university in Hong Kong Right, founded in 1963 as an amalgamation of three uh, foundation refugee colleges, it was Chinese University of Hong Kong now captured the energies of the same US state and private actors that were so interested in Nanta in the early 50s. And in their policy documents, right, CUHK becomes referred to as the Chinese university for the 10 million overseas Chinese. Comparatively, Singapore's Nanyang and the fledgling Ni'an College founded around the same time was increasingly perceived as a local institution serving nation building agendas in Singapore, Malaysia. In fact, Lee Doming, the inaugural vice chancellor of CUHK, right, himself a Chinese American who returned from Berkeley to take up the position, explicitly st stated that he aimed to make Chinese University of Hong Kong the Chinese university for the diaspora while letting Nanyang muddle along with his problems. Interestingly, Singapore's MOE, 
observing the rising prominence of Chinese University in Hong Kong, tried to get Li Doming to help with the reorganization of Nanyang, but was rebuffed as Li saw Nanyang not as a partner, but a source of competition for top international Chinese faculty and students. Interestingly, by the mid 60s, many Nanyang professors of, you know, of various different ideological persuasions all started to move to Chinese University of Hong Kong, including people like Wang De Zhao, Gui Yi Hian, Yan Yuan Zhang, Han Bu, and even Lin Yutang towards the end of his life took up a job at Chinese University of Hong Kong together with his son-in-law, Richard M. Lai, Lai Ming, who became the chief editor of Chinese University of Hong Kong Press. So since the merger and closure, or maybe closure of Nanda in 1980s, attempts to draw on its legacy in contemporary politics has been multiple. In Malaysia, of course, the continued presence of private Chinese education constantly invokes the Nanyang spirit as core to these you know, community efforts outside of state control. In Singapore, the Nanyang spirit has, of course, been invoked and maybe co-opted into a narrative of patriotic pioneers whose hard work, enterprise, philanthropy built the nation. I propose that maybe one other legacy through the um, perspective of Trans-Pacific Asia in the post-Cold War is the afterlife of you know, Cold War American efforts to shore up educational networks and intellectual ties. Even the 50s, right, US-led containment attempted somewhat unsuccessfully to shape the trajectories of Nanta within a broader region-making project, where sh shifting centers of global capital in the 80s and 90s, discourses of East Asian developmental model, et cetera, saw the return of Chinese-American intellectuals to Singapore promoting another version of Chinese education beyond China. Unlike the public protests surrounding Lin Yutang's um, first-class faculty from the Ivy League coming to Singapore in the 50s, right? the state, uh, Singapore State orchestrated project in the 80s and 90s to produce another form of diasporic Chinese culture and Confucian education stimulated quite a bit of cultural pride locally. Although these cultural is overtures, right? And here I include the founding of NTU and the Center for Chinese Language and Culture, et cetera, were rejected by many Nanyang alumni who were critical of the Singapore state's intrusions into a symbolic site of community building and educational activism. Looking into the more recent past, I suppose we can even view this history in light of present day new Cold War between the US and China as superpower rivalries are once again uh, reshuffling global educational networks. In an age of proliferating US satellite campuses in Asia, the global reach of American universities, Chinese-led initiatives like the Belt and Road or Confucius Institute scholarships for Global South students are now seeking to challenge this US-led educational order through educational infrastructures and networks. This illustrates how universities and education are not just sites of cultural politics, but of geopolitics. Thus, I think we can also recall the history of Nanyang University in, in the Trans-Pacific Cold War with an eye on these contemporary educational collaborations, experiments, and the possibilities of and pitfalls of such exchanges in light of the collective work towards educational justice in the present. Um, so thanks very much everybody for listening and sorry for the long presentation. Um, and I just list here a couple of the key archives that I consulted um, as part of this project um, based in, in the United States. Um, and I look forward to your know, comments and questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Um, yeah. perhaps, okay. perhaps you could stop uh, sharing mm -hmm. the screen. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So, thank you very much, Shafra. I'm uh, really taken by how contemporary a lot of your uh, research seems, right? This idea about um, diaspora national, uh, nationalist claims uh, around Chinese communities. Um, your contestation over what Chineseness means, the sort of rootedness in local localities, regions uh, versus sort of the global, and also actually the precarity of, um, of of faculty, right? So this is something that we see in Singapore as well as Hong Kong increasingly uh, these days. Um, and to enlighten us uh, on uh, all of this, I'm sure uh, Wayne Wayne Soon from the University of Minnesota will uh, have a lot to say about this. Uh, Wayne, take it away. Well, thank you, Ian, and uh, thank you, Josh. I thought your presentation was great. I really look forward to reading your book, so whenever it comes out, so congratulations on finishing your PhD. I really look forward to your work in the future. So I just have three broad comments that might be helpful as you think about converting your dissertation into a book and questions that you might encounter from the reviewers. So reviewer one, reviewer two, reviewer three, right? So I'll be reviewer four today and give you some comments that will help you, hopefully. Right, my first comment is on the role of Tan Lak Se, right? Which I think is an interesting uh, story. I think he's sort, of, he's sort of in the background of your presentation and your chapter, because I think a lot of your actors, you know, focus on the uh, free Chinese refugees. They are focused on the United States role. 
and sort of the role of the Singapore government. But I'm interested in the role of the principal, right? The chancellor of the university. And oh, well, he's not the principal, he's the founder of the university, right? And so he seems to be, uh, you know, his role in the university is somewhat contradictory, right? On the one hand, he seems to be wanting university to flourish as a center for helping the Chinese educated Singaporeans, right? On the other hand, there's this broader ambition, right? To create kind of uh, trans-Pacific networks, as you argue. So does that impulse change over time? What's he kind of a player in these? Or is he sort of more of a someone in the background looking at what Ling Yutang and the others were doing? So I just want to hear a little bit more about him. And I really like your compare Second point I want to make, I really like your comparative histories. Um, I like how you talk about CUHK at the end, right? Because there, I heard a presentation of how the CUHK became a center, right, for American-funded, uh, uh, you know, Chinese university, quote unquote, right? And so I like that. But I want you to also think a little bit about a precedent, right? About university that was somewhat similar to the experience of Nanta in the fifties, which is Xiamen universities, right, in the thirties. So I've written, you know, I've written some about it, and Professor Wang Gongwu too, right, about the tumultuous. Uh, events between Lim Boon Kei, right, and Lu Xun, that's very famous. But two, right, folks like Ling Yutang, who also came to Xiamen, also had a bad time, right? Almost all of them had a bad time. Gu, was it Gu Jiegang, right, was a very famous sinologist, also came, you know, and, um, you know, one of the things that's really remarkable is, uh, which is related to my third point, is the imagination of the South Seas or Nanyang is generally, so one of the things that I noticed when I saw some of the documents that Lu Xun and the others write about, they really hated the food in Xiamen, right? They thought that the food in the South was not to their liking. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, Lin Bung King even uh, gave a cook, right? Hired a cook to cook the food for Lu Xun because he was complaining so much. So I was interested in thinking a little bit about, you know, can you say a little bit more about how these free Chinese refugees, right, upon coming to Singapore and Malaya, they are, how did they imagine Singapore to be? And when they came, was it was it partially because of their disillusionment, of their kind of yearning for America, or was their imagination of a so-called free Chinese world not manifested in Singapore itself, right? And we know that the context is very different. For example, in Singapore and Taiwan, right, Singapore uh, has a much more working class background, uh, the, uh, the levels of secondary education was prob probably not as high as Taiwan, which the Japanese colonial government did promote secondary secondary education. So given a context of perhaps a more quote-unquote fertile ground for undergraduates that perhaps the professors found more excitement in teaching, right? So I'm just trying to get a sense of that interaction, right? And did the students play a role, right? Which is related to the question because in Xiamen, right, part of the failure was that the students were riled up by these so-called leftist intellectuals, right, to protest against Lim Boon King, who they saw as deeply conservative, who only spoke English, didn't know what was happening. Was that happening in Nanda too, right? Was the student a criteria, was a factor for many of the faculty to want to stay or for them want to leave? And the last point I want, because I really want to open up a question, is the broader question of the U.S. role in Southeast Asia. One of the questions that I thought was very interesting was the role of Walter Judge, right? Who's actually a Minnesota congressman, um, yeah, interestingly. Uh, but Walter Judge, of course, is very important, right? He gave a lot of funds to uh, the universities, not only in Nanda, but in Taiwan too, right? So in my book, I talk about the National Defense Medical Center, about how Robert Lim, who was the son of Lim Boon King and Lu Jida and other overseas Chinese, managed to leverage a lot of resources from the US government to help to develop the National Defense Medical University, which is one of the most important medical centers in Taiwan today. So I was trying and trying to flip the script really back to my first point, right? Was were there Singaporean actors that actually leverage on the US connection, besides Lee Kuan Yew, of course, you, you showed that really great example, but the act the actors within Nanta try to leverage uh, the US and therefore maybe the center of the story is not so much the United States, but the actors in Singapore that leverage these assistance. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Wayne. Um, so uh, for uh, audience members, um, you see that there's a chat available. If you can put your questions in the chat, I will uh, direct them um, to, to Joshua. Right. Um, and also thanks, Wayne, for channeling the spirit of Walter Judd uh, from Minnesota. Um, so 
Um, I guess uh, as people gather up their thoughts and, and questions, we uh, uh, Charin has a question that I'll sort of throw out there, and I, I've got one too. Um, so uh, when you talk about the tail wagging the dog, Joshua, um, you know, was there is there any evidence that you've seen that the intention for a bait and switch, uh, you know, was that always there, or was it something that came to the PAP uh, later on? Bearing in mind, of course, that the PAP shifts its position, um, you know, uh, pre and post merger. Um, and uh, I'll I'll throw in here as well uh, this idea. We talk about a Chinese university outside um, of of uh, of the mainland uh, of mainland or the, or the PRC. Uh, what was this idea of Chinese or Chineseness? Bearing in mind that you know this is it's something that's contested. Uh, the idea of uh, Chinese nationality or Chinese nationalism is something of a late 19th century vintage. So how did these actors that you talked about, how did they understand what Chinese meant or did not mean? I mean, Wayne sort of illustrated this quite clearly in terms of the food, right? Um, so why don't we start there? Uh, and then I'll look at, I'll collect the questions that come. Um, Joshua? Thanks so much, Ian, for the question. Can, can I just clarify the second question? So it's about the conceptions of Chineseness at, mm -hmm. uh, uh, among the, the various different of... actors. Right. Okay. With, with okay. The US, yeah. The local actors, so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 As, uh, great. Thanks. Maybe I'll take the question, the first question first. Um, I mean, the tales by King Dogs. I mean, to what extent was you know were they kind was the kind of Singapore government trying to bait the foundation and kind of shifting the emphasis and the scholarships? I I'm not that I'm I'm not that sure. Uh, although I mean, the because I I haven't found much on the Singapore side. So the only thing I'm working with is is the kind of the U.S. documents and kind of the dossiers of the students and how they were trying to kind of make sense of the situation. So, um, I mean there was definitely an initial shift, and I think what it reflects was that the foundation's early interest was really in Nanyang University. I mean they they were kind of nominally interested in Singapore Poly, and their interest in Singapore University or University of Malaya was quite limited. It was limited to the Department of Chinese Studies, actually. I mean for the most part. So, um. There is obviously kind of a kind of strong emphasis in the kind of Chinese higher education, right? You know, for Chinese students, right, uh, rerouting these networks away from communist China. So I think the China factor is a big part of of the early, um, the early early conversation, and then it shifts more broadly. So, um, and then maybe to the second question about the the Chinese ness, I I think that's an interesting question, and I mean, the Cold War. I mean, the early fifties. I think really kind of kind of creates multiple different Chinas, right? And I, I think if we look at the, especially in the Hong Kong context where, you know, um, sorry to bring in the Hong Kong again, but, the, you know, you multiple different colleges, right? Refugee colleges sponsored by different kind of, um, you know, US foundations, missionaries, Chinese intellectuals, you have, you know, like a Confucian China, right? Like Qianmu, New Asia College, you have Christian missionaries, you know, trying to kind of recover some legacy of Christian higher education, like right? it's Chongqi College, the Christian China. And then, you know, so so I think these various different Chinas, and then maybe in Nanyang University, you have a kind of Republican China, kind of an ideal of, of kind of modernity, or maybe the May 4th modernity, right? I mean, students kind of quite, quite intent of recovering some kind of legacy of, of Nanyang, as a successor of the May 4th heritage, a kind of liberal kind of maybe um, May 4th spirit or something like that. And uh, interestingly, in one of the evaluations that in the 1959 University Review Commission, you know, um, I think it's by yeah, S.L. Prescott, right? Somebody who came in with the British Indian University Council, right? He says, well, Nanyang claims that they were kind of, in, there was nothing that you could compare Nanyang with, but if you really had to compare, compare them with the Republican era, you know, university and, and they fared quite well. So I think, I think there is a sense of that, that genealogy as being um, quite, quite significant or important in this context. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I've got three questions um, that I'll I'll pose to you together. So we're going to take notes. So in this way, we're trying to consolidate time a little bit. So uh, Eka Liao is uh, wondering if this uh, presentation, um, the narrative in your presentation is a little bit too uh, rosy or positive about the way that the Asia Foundation sort of adapted from uh, David, the David Marshall the New York government uh, to the PAP posi uh, uh, government's position. Um, since the past, the way that the, the, the Asia Foundation works tends to uh, rest a lot on the local representative and um, his, right, in, the, in, that, in those days it was largely hit, uh, him, right, uh, with uh, local political personalities. Um, and, and the degree to which, you know, that affected, you know, whether people thought they were, they were the right people were being pushed in and so on. And also, um, given what happened to Nanda after 65, right, um, you know, 
do you consider the Nanyang Graduate uh, Fellowship a success of the Asia Foundation? And do you see a potential issue where the focus on trans the Trans-Pacific Cold War story uh, sort of submerges um, and sort of pushes aside, right, the local Cold War story? Uh, Gong Jianwen, um, he's interested in, um, you know, the... Um, the sort of view of the sort of official uh PAP narrative and the Nanda uh, alumni and how that um how that sort of there's a tension between it, especially after the merger with Singapore University. Um, so how do you make sense of the silences and illusions uh, uh toward the U.S. and the Asia Foundation involvement in Nanda? Um, was a different time in the Cold War because we sometimes look at the Cold War in different stages uh, among students, uh, you know, between now and afterwards. So, um. Just uh, the third question, I know there's some more that are coming in, but uh, just to sort of look at uh, Leong Yiting's question about, you know, um, when when you look at the sort of response to these um, uh, Americanized intellectuals that, that come in, um, you know, uh, how did the local Chinese public respond to them in a uh, apart from uh, just Ling Yutang himself, right? Uh, so especially given the this sort of view that I alluded to at the beginning, that you know Nanda was this leftist hotbed, right? Um, but you know, it is uh, this idea of preserving Chineseness in some ways, um, is in a way uh very conservative, right? Um, so could could you sort of touch on that? And then we'll go on to the other questions. Thanks. Okay, th thanks so much for the questions. And well, they're all quite long, so let me try and uh, see if I can get to at least some of them. Um, so for Edgar's question, hi Edgar. Um, so so thanks for the question. And um, in terms of the first point about the question, I mean the foundation representative changes multiple times. Um, interestingly, the, the the foundation representative that comes in in 1965 used to be one of the bachelor missionaries at New Asia College, right? Douglas Murray. He was writing a dissertation on overseas Chinese education at the same time he was. Um, you know, doing the research, he was quite he was quite respectful and humble. Um, the and then the foundations objectives change over time, right? So I mean, was it a success? I mean, it depends. Um, it was not a success in strengthening Nanda faculty, right? That was complete failure. But it was it was it was successful in cultivating a new generation of American educated, I guess, civil servants, right? So I mean, I think there's there's a transition in the foundations kind of aims roughly around you know the turn of the decade, which I think is a really interesting uh, kind of way to kind of mark time with with, with the, you know an initial focus on uh, third China, right, or kind of diasporic China, and then by the turn of the decade, looking at you know everything as you know free Asians, right, and free Asians as you know non or anti communist U S allied states, right, within a kind of interconnected free Asia. So it was it was I think successful in in cultivating free Asian. And the, the foundations, incidentally, their the sponsorship towards Chao Sheng or overseas Chinese students who were going to Taiwan at the time also ends off in 1959, right? So they were not, in, in a way, it was a kind of a success from another different perspective with shifting goals by the turn of the decade. Um, do I see a potential issue where the focus of the Trans-Pacific story submerged the Cold War, the local story? Yes, I do. Um, and I mean, I, this is not the comprehensive history. I think this is just one overlooked angle into an otherwise very well documented history. I mean, I think the whole book series published by the NTU CCLC, right, the, the Nanda Li Shi Chong Shu, I think some of those volumes really do a good job. I think the best one, I think, is uh, Zhou Zhao Cheng, and Nanda and the Singapore government. I mean, that's a well researched monograph that I think does the, the local story good justice while also situating the regional context. Um, so I just wanted to bring in this you know, extra archive to maybe supplement that narrative a little bit. Um, to and Jim Wen's question, do, the silences towards them uh, in the Nanda. I mean, in a way, I, I guess there are multiple dimensions to the story and the historical memory. And, and so for, for in terms of the students, for instance, I mean, the, the law was going on, right? I mean, I, I cited Wang Kang Ding, um, Wang Kang Ding's um, statistics. And I mean, he made it, he was one of the first cohort of graduates and he made it his life's work to document the um the you know the the, the career paths and you know the contributions of Nanta alumni and I think and he he was very open. I mean he got a scholarship from the Asia Foundation to go to a Southern Illinois University to study journalism. And he was very open about the fact that you know Asia Foundation was the biggest you know supporter of Nanta graduates going overseas. Of course, I mean you know in these alumni publications, of course, they cite the fact that they were able to qualify for you know overseas education as testament to the fact that you know they were academically quite good. Of course, I mean they were, but um, they also had you know a, a path a path forward. Is is I guess the point I'm trying to make. Um, was it different at the time during the Cold War among students as opposed to now? Um, 
Well, I guess what I will say is that in, in some of my conversations with not, not alumni, but with you know, children or relatives of Nanta professors who were living in Nanta you know, in the early 50s, um, in the late 50s, early 60s, I mean, what they remember was the end of the year, right? The contract renewal period, right? Where they were in danger of being deported, right? They were very, I mean, so they remember that. So I think that's another kind of, you know, part of the local story that I think is, is not um, often you know, emphasized. Um, the final question, eating's question, um, so uh, how did local Chinese public respond to America, uh, to these new intellectuals? I think, I asked, um, the existing scholarship, the hotbed of communism, uh, the cultural preservation question, um, given the existing scholarship, I kind of forgot about the, let me, let me just, uh, I mean, we can take a couple of questions and I'll, I'll return back to it. Okay, so, well, the, the thing about it, I mean, it's really about the tension, <laughs> okay. right? The, the tension between your, uh, the sort of leftist, uh, anti uh, anti American sort of element, right, in Nanda, and mm. and the mm. sort of very conservative vision that uh, some of these people were were bringing. Um, but so um, I get, uh, I, I think it's true as a question too about um, the extent to which you've looked at. Um, documents from uh, CUHK and also the private um, the private papers of a lot of these individuals, because it seems that you draw a lot from US archives, which of course gives an important perspective, but not the only perspective, given that you are looking at a multi-perspective sort of an account, right? Um, Wayne's also saying, hey, you didn't get to his question, so perhaps you could you could address uh, that too. I'll bring Wayne in uh, later. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, uh... Uh, uh, yeah, Hercules for the for the question about the private papers and uh, and uh, kind of archives outside. Um, yeah, so so I think I, I um the Asia Foundation. I mean, is, is the core of of the, the paper for today. Um, outside, I I think um one of the well, this is the U.S. based, but I mean, a lot of the archive was produced. It was the Hong uh, Hong Ye papers, right? Or William Hong, who was the research fellow at Harvard Yen Ching, he came to Nanda in nineteen fifty nine to review Nanda as part of the External Review Commission. So he had this ten year correspondence with Zhang Tianze, right? With who was you know dean of arts and who was I think really a kind of overlooked figure in the um early history of of Nanda and got overshadowed by uh, somebody like like, like Pan Shou or Pang Guo Chu, right? Who was you know general secretary to Tan Lak Sai. So so I mean then. I mean, th those kind of set of correspondences really give a sense of, of I think, both the initial kind of, you know, many of these, you know, maybe non-anti-communist scholars looking to the US and then some of the challenges he faced in there and then finally trying to get out, right? And, and you know, he's, you know, trying to get a recommendation to Hawaii and some of the difficulties in doing so. Um, and so, so, so that's one one set of archives I think quite interesting. And then the other is you know published memoirs, right? Published memoirs of some of the the prophet, you know, the the people who were involved, and not just Lin Yutang, of course, Lin Tai Yi's you know <laughs> biography became was very much controversial in Singapore. But I mean others like uh, like Hong Lie, right? His memoirs, he also um, he also talks about his you know short time in Nanda, and you know many of his you know students from Harvard and from Yanjing who were also in Nanda, right? So that's an interesting connection. Somebody like Xiong Shi Yi, uh, who also um, was in Nanta very briefly. There's a biography of him who just came out and the trans Chinese translation also came out, right? He also reflected on that early period. So, I mean, some of these individuals, I think, um, uh, come up. And then, oh, just to the point about CUH getting, one of the interesting things I found in the you know, British archives is, you know, the CO1045, the you know, British Inter-University Council, right? Some of the Nanta files were also kind of categorized within the Chinese University of Hong Kong files, I mean, which, you know, also suggests some kind of inter-referencing. Um, yeah, so. Uh, is there something from uh, Wayne that you'd like to respond to? Uh, yes, uh, uh, Wayne's questions. Yeah, a number of a number of them. So the, uh, I think the, the, so Wayne's got three different questions. I think the first question about Tan Lak Sai and, and how does, he, whether he, you know, his role. I mean, yeah, I think definitely he was at the backdrop of all this. And I didn't go too much into him. Of course, there's a whole monograph dedicated to Tan Lak Sai and Nanyang Dashi. But um, I think what I found quite interesting in the kind of the archive that I looked at and, you know, um, in, in, in especially the U.S. foundations, we're trying to make sense of who this was and what was going on, was their kind of, the kind of symbolic work that people like Tan Lak Sai, the wealthy Nanyang merchants were doing, right? This gets you a third question, actually, with the imagination of the South Seas, right? So for instance, right, the Yale in China Foundation, which was also looking to give money to 
to New Asia College. I mean, initially, they were saying, well, you know, wow, shall we also get, you know, the Nanyang merchants to give us some money so we can help uh, the, 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 the refugees in Hong Kong? So, I mean, there was a sense of, okay, of course, not, uh, you know, Nanyang is wealthy, right? Nanyang merchants is wealthy. But then I think where it gets quite interesting is that, you know, of course, the, the merchants also had the money, right? With the money, the leverage. So, um, in, in my kind of the broader project, I also make a kind of comparison between Lin Yutang and Qian Mu, right? You know, Lin Yutang, of course, you know, two of them, you know, very famous Republican era intellectuals, you know, somewhat different ideological persuasions, right? In the early 50s, you know, part of, you know, big institution building movements. Uh, and then, you know, Lin Yutang, of course, he makes his claims for the first class university and all that. And, you know, he gets booted out of Singapore after six months, right? Qian Mu, right? You know, Confucian, you know, new Confucian intellectual coming to Hong Kong with, you know, no money, no resources, you know, wanting to recreate a Song or Ming Dynasty Confucian Academy. And then within three years, you know, he says, oh, I'm a very lucky guy, right? I got money from Ford Foundation, from Harvard Yenching, and from the Yale missionaries. And, you know, so it's ironic, quite, quite ironic if we kind of put these two individuals in, um, in, in comparison with, with each other. Um, yeah. And I, I think, I don't know if that answers the second question about the Lim Boon King, Lushin. I mean, yeah, but I think right, this, this figure of the, of the university president is quite interesting um, yeah, to, to, to think about, especially in the context with, you know, with, of course, you have the, the funding, right, the structures of, of, of you know, of, of, of funding and influence. You have students, you have, you know, the, 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 the kind of symbolic role of these kind of intellectual celebrities and, you know, where does the leverage lie, right? Um, yeah. Wayne, do you have uh, anything you'd like to add here? No, uh, I thought that, well, I mean, I, I have some questions too, but I know people have questions in the um, Q&A. Well, well, why, why, why don't you put it uh, in there? So we've got a, a couple of minutes. Uh, so why don't you just throw it in there? Yeah, I mean, I think, Josh, maybe uh, just to kind of you know follow up some of the questions that have already been raised. Uh, so I, maybe I'll press you a little bit more to say about the imaginations of the South. I like the comparison with Chen Mu. I think that's really important and fascinating. But I think part of the story too is that um, uh, as some of the commentators suggest that uh, focusing on the intellectuals themselves may also be a productive strand, right? In thinking about um, this whole trans-Pacific nature of the project, right? It is a US empire project. It is a Singaporean project. But I think the trans-Pacific project is not just comparative, but imaginary, right? So, and of course, I'm not going to use the word Sinophone, right? Because I think it's beyond Sinophone, but I just want you to, I guess my question is, how did they see Singapore, right? Maybe you can answer that question, right? Did they, were they disillusioned of anything about Singapore? Were they excited about coming to Singapore? So I just want you to say a little bit more about that. Can yeah. I just throw something? I mean, there is a Sinophone aspect to it, this imagination of uh, right some sort of Chinese world outside of right. that is a very Sinophone uh, aspect to it. Uh, and we're also throwing this question about the non about the non conventional faculty, right? That might, might be worth right. doing. So, um, Joshua, you have the last word. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, so, uh, to to address the which question, I mean, and, uh, yeah. So, I think. The limitation here is that we, it's, it's quite hard to kind of reconstruct an archive of these, the, the, the faculty, especially, you know, a long-term archive. I mean, I think I only have a few of them because many of them just show up and then they, 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 they lose them again. But, well, I think some of them did stay. I mean, so that's the interesting part, right? I mean, Ling Yutang says, well, you know, all, all his faculty left with him. I mean, it's not true. Some of them did stay, like, like Hu Bo Yuan, right? One of the early, you know, the first dean of scientists. He went to the University of Malaya, right? So, uh, and so he, he stayed on, in, you know, to, or he died in Singapore in the 70s. So, I mean, that's one person who, you know, some, you know settled, right? So, but of course, not affiliated with Nanda, but, you know, doing other things in, in Singapore. Um, and even Zhang Tianzi, I mentioned a couple of times. I mean, uh, I mean, he was, you know, affiliated with the South Sea Society. I mean, he was quite interested in, you know, maritime kind of history and he was even studying I mean really studying Malay and you know after he was fired from Nanta he spent two years in the University of Malaya library doing his own research so um, I mean I, I think he is somebody that you know of course he, you know in the 50s he was you know saying I want to go to the US and all that but I think he was also you know he embraced uh, you know his location I mean he studied Malay um, you know he you know adjusted his research to kind of look at kind of maritime South China more generally I think really an interesting and overlooked figure um, you know Edgar um yeah, Li Yinan, right? The, the the physical education. Yes, I mean, so so that's one of the few kind of frontiers, you know, who was you know local, um, cultivated, right? And then went went abroad for six months, kind of came back. Um, but so not exactly fitting the mold of the refugee intellectuals. I mean, this was a local born kind of Singapore Chinese, right? But um, I think yeah, also an interesting figure to to look at in its own right. All right. Um, I guess this brings us very much uh, to time. I'm sorry if the questions and all that we couldn't quite get to uh, from from the audience. 
Uh, but you know, thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for a very enlightening talk. A uh, very different angle uh, on that, especially I think also when we think about ideas of foreign in influence in Singapore, that you know is of course quite heated right now. Um, and also thank you, Wayne, for your very insightful comments. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Uh, do look out uh, for our next uh, Academia SG uh, Junior Scholar event and uh, also other events. And if you're, if you're interested in some of the commentaries and um, and writings that we make available, you can find that at academia.sg. All right. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everybody uh, and uh, we'll see you at our next event. Thank you.